if, can you help me out? What's your name? Eli. Eli, I met you, remember at camp? Mm-hmm. Do you remember this? Yeah. yeah, I do, old man. Here we go. You, if you would, and I need one other person, if you could, uh, one person who can hand out the other one, just give one sheet to everybody, and the rest of them just set somewhere in the back. And then, and you grab these. What's your name? Patrick. Patrick? You're going to be coming out, right? I saw your name on the list. All right. If you would, just give one. These here, you don't have to be, be looking at these while, while I'm uh, preaching here tonight. But uh, I would suggest, for those of you who are coming out soul winning this week, bring them with you because there's something I want to go over with you. And uh, don't ever get rid of these. These are real simple, real simple. If you hang around me long enough, you will find out that I'm a very simple person. Uh, I like to keep it simple. The Lord does not make uh, complicated the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, I thank Pastor Hoff for having me here. I met, like I said, Pastor Larry down at, uh, at camp back when we were, uh, what would you say, May, I guess you said, right? And uh, I've uh, had the pleasure of hearing Pastor Larry preach a few different times. And uh, I will say it's a little daunting. Uh, I am called to... Uh, uh, be a soul winner. By the way, every Christian is called to be a soul winner on, on some level, but uh, definitely uh, the ministry God has called me to, and he has, uh, I believe, specially gifted me in soul winning, which is not to say that you're not specially gifted. Everybody has at least one gift of, of the Spirit. Uh, what yours is, I, I don't know, but there are so many things in the Christian world that truly I'm just not gifted for. So I just want you to understand this. Uh, with all humility, I will tell you, when you come out with me, I am there to teach you. It would be my greatest pleasure that you, when I'm done after an hour or two, you are able to go off on your own and share the gospel. Now, it's, when you're starting out, it's going to take a little time, right? But if you listen to what I tell you, you will cut down on so many mistakes because, trust me, I have made every mistake there is. So praise the Lord, you are looking at somebody who will knock out 90% of the things that you would have to figure out on your own by doing them wrong. And so you will learn a lot. And, uh, and by the way, I learn every time I go out soul winning, even if it's somebody who's just recently started sharing their faith in Christ, there's always something to learn. And uh, as I said, I, I thank Pastor Hop. I do not take it lightly. The fact that you would have us here uh, teaching soul winning. Uh, my name, as he said, is Randy O'Brien, and uh, me and my wife Tammy are, in fact, from Calvary Road Baptist, which is down in uh, southern Indiana, just across from Louisville, Kentucky. If you're not familiar, you know, give you a general idea geographically where we're talking about. And uh, thank you so much for your hospitality. Thank you for the wonderful uh, hotel room, and uh, we do look forward to a productive five days together and also uh, honoring God, giving Him glory, and uh, most importantly, right there, giving God the glory. I'm encouraged to see so many of you who've signed up. Truly, there's uh, time to still sign up. I'm available all Thursday, tomorrow, all Friday, and all Saturday. If you suddenly come up with a, with a uh, you know, opening in your day where you can go out soul winning with me, and you don't know that just now, but it comes up the last minute, you make sure you get a hold of Pastor Larry. And, uh, or if you want, I can give you a card with my phone number on it this evening. And trust me, if I'm not already out with some other member from your church, I am there, okay? Uh, that's what I'm here for. Use me, please. Uh, like I said, I'm very encouraged. And, uh, and I will tell you this. If you come out, I guarantee you that the Lord will use the time that you spend out there soul winning, learning, uh, it, it, it will make your Christian walk better. It truly will. By the way, you're not going to be put in any uncomfortable position. I'm not going to make you talk. If there comes a point where you feel like you want to talk, praise the Lord, that's fine. But I'm not there to embarrass anybody. I'm there to just let the Lord work on your heart. Just be prayed up, okay? If you've got a dead body in the trunk, I'm asking you right now, get along with the Lord and take care of that, okay? Because I don't want you going out soul with me with a dead body in the trunk. I'm just saying I'm picky that way. So uh, we're going to have a good time, truly. Uh, my wife and I, up until January of this year, had spent three years with Amazing Grace Mission, uh, going to the fairs across America and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the best way to describe those three years 
would be to quote from the opening of Charles Dickens' book, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. It was the best of times because the Lord allowed Tammy and I personally to lead between 1,800 and 1,900 people to Christ. And I know some of you are going, uh, oh, so you keep track. Now, nah. the reason why I know this is because for tax purposes, I was keeping track of my supplies. And we would send out, in addition to uh, a decision card, we would send it out to the nearest independent fundamental Baptist church that, that uh, was in the area of that person, because they had their address, so we could look it up, pair them up with a good Bible-believing church. Uh, we would also send out uh, an encouragement letter, so I knew how many we had sent out, and so uh, it's, it's not that I'm keeping track for the sake of, hey, hey, not bad, no, it's not that at all, uh, I was just checking out my supplies for Uncle Sam, so when I did my taxes. Um, I am, by the way, going to mostly read this, because it is important that there's certain things in here that I don't want to just gloss over, I want to make sure that you, you get a hold of them, and uh, as I said, the best part was getting to lead uh, between 18 and 1,900 people to Christ during those three years on the road. Uh, but it was also the worst of times because I found out that very few Christians even know where to start in leading someone to Christ. And trust me, we've been all over this side of the country, east of the Mississippi, up and down from Florida, uh, up, uh, to the, up north, all the way up into Michigan and what have you. And uh, it came as a shock to us to find out how few Christians really know how to effectively share their faith in Jesus Christ. And by the way, when you got saved, the reason why you weren't immediately taken out of here is because God wants you to be his mouthpiece right here in this earthly life that you're living. Uh, anyway, it did come as a shock to us to find out so many Christians didn't know how to share their faith. But as a result, the Lord burdened us with this ministry to teach soul winning to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I'll be going out in ships with the men tomorrow. My wife will be here later in the afternoon, and she will go out with the women on Thursday and Friday. And she'll be leaving on Friday night because she is a registered nurse. She works at Kentucky Anna Medical Center down there, and she has to be to work. Uh, she gets up at 5 o'clock in the morning. So Saturday morning, she gets up at 5 o'clock. So it's not as though she doesn't want to be here on Saturday, too. She would love to. She just can't be. So... Uh, she can take you out, if need be, in pairs. I know that tomorrow night there's two women who possibly might have to go together, but if you don't have to, trust me, you'll find out that it'll be far more effective for your learning, and it is just much more uh, reasonable and effective to go up to somebody with just two people instead of three. Uh, like I told Pastor, it's not as though I look like I'm a gangbanger or anything like that, but we don't need three people converging on someone who's trying to figure out what exactly of you know, do these people have in mind here. Uh, you're going to love my wife. Uh, truly, she is uh, an awesome helpmeet. And I know this is a little uh, of an aside, but guys, treat your wife the way God would have you treat her. I'll tell you what, I still leave little notes around the house for my wife, uh, but I learned this recently, and you might want to take this to heart. Um, if you are going to, in your cute little note, use your little pet name for your wife. Uh, spelling is extremely important, okay? I found out that uh, sweetie and sweaty are not the same word, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Through thick or thin, you'll always be sweaty to me. That's not as romantic as I wanted it to turn out to be. But over the next few days, we're going to get you started on the how-to of soul winning. We're talking confrontational soul winning, and by confrontational... We're not talking argumentative or rude. We are talking about uh, Christ-like and scriptural. And it's actually face-to-face -face sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now understand, God is pleased with you when you invite someone out to Faith Baptist Church that they might hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. They might not be saved either. That's God's business, right? That's between God and them. But God is pleased when you invite someone out to church. God is pleased when you anonymously leave a gospel tract somewhere. God is pleased when you physically hand a tract to someone and say, would you please read this when you get a chance? He's pleased by all of these things. But I believe God is especially pleased when you open your mouth and tell someone how to trust his precious son as their savior. Romans 10, 13, and 14 Beginning in 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? God commands you and I to be that preacher. I know a lot of people think it's just the pastor's job to go out soul winning. Might I say that this pastoring thing is one of those things that I could not possibly even begin to do. A pastor wears so many hats. Now, a pastor is required to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But uh, they also counsel. They put together their sermons. I mean, there is so much that goes into pastoring that, you know, it's only been over the last few years that I came to realize that, you see, I've got to be very careful about when I even contact my pastor. He's got so much going on between making visits to hospitals and what have you. But it is the job of every Christian to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out there. Now, who here who's never shared their faith and is going to come out is a little nervous right now? Yeah? Oh, good, good. And the rest of you are lying, the ones that don't have your hand up. And that's okay. That's okay. I tell people this. Look, you know, people go, oh, yeah, well, you're just a natural. You just, you just walk up to them. Trust me. No, no, no. There was a time when I was not nearly as natural as I am right now. The reason why God has blessed me is because I have been diligent in going. No matter how embarrassed I was, no matter how stupid I looked, I just kept going. Because I was saved at the age of 39. I'm 54 years old right now. Yes, Eli, this is what 54 looks like. Mm, pray for the rapture. I'll tell you what. The first thing that went through my mind when I trusted Christ as my Savior is, how am I 39 years old? I never heard this before. You know what? 15 years later, now I know why. Because Christians just don't share their faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm just so thankful that God got the gospel to me before I was dead and in hell. Because trust me, there were plenty of opportunities in my life that my life, uh, you know, being out with the guys doing uh, nefarious things where I could have been dead and in hell right now. I don't take my salvation lightly. But for those of you who've never shared your faith in Christ, we're going to give you a framework to get you started. As Pastor said, I'll come up here. There's nothing I enjoy more than going out and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But to be able to exponentially get more people out into the field, man, God is glorified by that, okay? Uh, and for you experienced soul winners, I hope I can teach you something. I think I probably can. Uh, but at the same time, understand this. I think you probably can teach me something too. So understand, it's a two-way street. Now, turn to a story we're all familiar with. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to make a very simple uh, application of this, but in Numbers chapter 13, and we're not going to stand. Typically, we'll have someone stand, but I'm going to be skipping down through this, this uh, chapter in Numbers, and uh, we're going into, in fact, a little bit into 14. But... Uh, you're going to be standing uh, a little too long, and I don't want that. So Numbers uh, chapter 13, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses obeyed and sent them. Then you skip down to verse 17, if you would where Moses tells these 12 spies specifically what they'll be expected to spy out when they're in the land of Canaan. God's word says, beginning in verse 17, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents, or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. And if you remember the story, man, they had, to, they had to, a couple of men holding the grapes, man, a big, huge, I remember from VBS even seeing them, just huge mutant grapes that they brought back. Well, the 12 spies obeyed, they spied out the land, then they returned, and if you skip down to Numbers 13, verse 25, God's word says, And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Hey, check out the grapes, right? 
pomegranates are in there too and some other things, but the grapes, the one I always remember. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Well, you had to imagine that people were pretty excited right about now, thinking, whoo this is great, and it's all ours. Come on, let's go take it. We all love grapes. Nevertheless, there aren't too many happy endings in life, really. Salvation is one of them, obviously. But in Numbers 13, 28, one of those guys with the evil report says, nevertheless, this is one of the ten spies who came back with that evil report, the negative report, right? Nevertheless, and you know, these people, especially the guys who love the grapes, were going, oh, great, great. I knew it was too good to be true. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Oh, that they were only tents, wouldn't that be great? We could just unzip the flap, smack them around, take over. But no, the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. But then Caleb, one of the spies that came back with a good report, the other one, of course, being Joshua. Caleb, one of the two spies who brought back a good report, speaks. And you know who I'm talking about? The uh, no good stinking troublemaker in the eyes of these ten spies. And then in verse 30 of Numbers 13, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. And right about now, you know, the ten naysaying spies hear Caleb and think, Whoa, whoa, whoa! But the men that went up with him, this is verse 31, said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Basically what they're saying right now is, hey, Mr. Sunshine, Caleb, dude, did you hear what we said? We know you were back there spying out the land too. We said those were giants back there. We didn't say, gee, those are, there are ants there. We said, no, there are giants, not gee, there are ants. There's a difference. One is, gee, there are ants. The other one is, there are giants back there. And so which did the people believe? Well, what does human nature tell you? I know you know the story. The evil or the good report? Numbers 14, 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And by the time we arrive at verse 6 of chapter 14, Caleb and now Joshua too are renting their clothes, ripping them apart and pleading for their people to go in and take this awesome land that God had promised to them. In verse 9 of Numbers 14, God's word says, Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. We're going to eat them up. Their defense has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But of course, we don't need Paul Harvey to tell us the rest of the story. Forty years of needless death and suffering while wandering in the wilderness. It was, in effect, a 40-year death march. The Lord tells them in Numbers 14, 29, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Of all the spies, only Joshua and Caleb remained to enter into the promised land 40 years later. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that uh, our brother, the Apostle Paul, 
said in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work on the hearts of the people here at Faith Baptist Church. I pray, pray that you would bless them richly with your presence. I pray that you would help them understand what a wonderful, joyful thing it is to give you all the honor and glory as we go out and do that thing which pleases you to the uttermost, telling people how they can trust your precious Son as their Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Think of all the pain and misery God's chosen people brought upon themselves because of that disobedience to God. God who so very clearly told them that he would be with them and he would give them the land. As in all of God's word, of course, there's so much to this story. I've heard this story preached in, well, I don't know how many different ways, several, and all of them good. But tonight I just want you to see this very simple point. There are consequences when we disobey God. Consequences that result when we fear man more than we fear God. Look around at this once great nation of ours. Because Christians have disobeyed God in getting the gospel out, the United States is now filthy, immoral, more and more so each day, and swirling down quickly into the toilet bowl of history. We're murdering human babies in their mother's wombs, selling those little babies' body parts as if they were scrap metal. We're allowing sodomites to marry and raise children. God wants them saved. And I hate to break it to you, we born-again believers are mostly to blame. As in the story of the 12 spies, Satan has lied to us like he lied to the 10 spies and, and made us doubt God. We hear this phantom evil report of soul winners having doors slammed in their faces, people verbally attacking them, people uh, physically attacking them, even reporting them to authorities. And well, besides, soul winning is such a drudgery. I'm here to tell you, you have been sold a bill of goods. You have been lied to. I'm here to tell you personally, this good report based on 15 years of blissful so winning that you are, in fact, being lied to in the most audacious way. And by the way, even if they were not lying to you about the soul winners and what happens to them, and those reports happen to be true, which, by the way, in some countries, those reports are true today, and they keep on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, though. Even if those lies were true, God is still on our side. Amen. Psalm 118.6 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? We born-again believers are so easily to lead, lead, that is, to believe a lie, when we're in fear. But if God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, that's what he means. He's God. He can't lie. If he lied, he would cease to be God. It's impossible for God to lie. When I or anyone else share the gospel of his precious son, Jesus Christ, God is glorified and pleased that his children are obediently fulfilling the Great Commission. And don't you realize if he's commanded you to go, he will be pleased to protect and empower you as you go? Acts 1.8, and God's word says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. By the way, this green field is your Jerusalem. We go in his power and for his glory. And if you'll obey God and go, he will show you things that are truly supernatural. Uh, by the way, we were at the fairs for three years, up until January this last year, like I said. But before that, I had been going soul winning constantly. And by the way, I worked a 12-hour job. So I don't want you to think that I just somehow am some rich kid born with a silver spoon in his mouth, okay? Uh, no, I worked at, uh, at Dow Chemical in bulk loading, of all things, as you can see. Quite the Arnold Schwarzenegger body type. But uh, I was constantly soul winning when I got off work, man. I loved it. Couldn't believe that more Christians didn't understand how awesome it was. 
but I can't make anybody do anything. Only the Holy Spirit can get a hold of a person. But check this out. We were at a fair in South Carolina, and I could tell you hundreds of stories, so I got to whittle it down, and I think, well, maybe I'll tell them that, maybe I'll tell them that. I mean, this, Lord, you did something there that was like something I don't think I'll ever see again, but, but what about this? Well, a guy named Robbie Burns comes up to the booth one time at South Carolina, at the Columbia, uh, Columbia, South Carolina. It was the South Carolina State Fair. And uh, he was missing, like, uh, the top five or six teeth in his mouth. And uh, anyway, I asked him, I said, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die, Robbie? I said, how sure are you if you died today? Would you say 50, 75, 100%? Well, he had no clue. I sat down, led him to Christ. This guy was so excited. And by the way, I don't use easy believism. I make him smell hell. You don't give God the glory by just kind of nipping and, and, and just kind of, you know, barely touching around the, uh-uh. You do not please God when you don't make these people understand their current condition, that they're sinners deserving of hell. And you'll see that when you come out soul winning with me, how people are pleased that you told them the truth. Now I understand, some people are upset when you try to share the gospel with them. By the way, that's a good thing. People misunderstand so many things about soul winning. Oh, I'm going to make them mad. Good! I don't mean that because I want them to be incon inconsolable. I mean because on some level, there's conviction. And that's a good thing. And it may be that God only wanted you to plant a seed, and later that night they might hear something about Jesus Christ on the radio. And it might not be for another week that they might see something on TV about Jesus Christ. Now, heaven help us if they get their, their doctrine from a, a televangelist, but I'm just saying, you know, God says, Jesus Christ over here, and then Jesus Christ later in the day, of the, you know, after about a week of hearing the name Jesus, and you were just part of the equation that person might wind up trusting Christ as their Savior. You're not the Savior. I'm not the Savior. God wants them in heaven more than we do. We're, the, we're just the unprofitable servant. We're the messenger. This is between them and God. Don't ever make it personal when you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Robbie Burns, 31 years old, trusts Christ as a Savior. He was so excited, absolutely thrilled. He's smiling, five, six teeth, missing up here, just smiling. I'm like, I don't know where you work, dude, but maybe you want to... Sign up for dental next time the, you know, the whole sign-up thing comes out in the fall. A day later, he shows up with his brother John, 27 years old. And he says, hey, Brother Randy, South Carolina, right? I'm from Michigan. I'm doing my best Southern impression. Brother Randy, he says, Can you, he's calling me brother already, by the way. I think because he heard one of the other missionaries call me brother, so he just thought, well, I guess we're all related now. And he was right. It's just weird to hear, though. He says, Brother Randy, he said, will you tell my brother John how he can know for sure he's going to heaven too? I sat down with John, and Robbie sat right there next to his brother. By the way, John smiled at me, and he's missing five or six teeth on the top of his mouth. And I'm thinking, man, that's weird. He sits down, and Robbie's punching him like this. He's going, come on, come on. He said, you listen. Because he said, well, Brother Rain's going to tell you it's going to be the most important thing you ever heard in your whole life. He said, now you listen, John. John, and I'm, by the way, I spend a good 30, 35, 40 minutes with these people. Now, I'm telling you, I make sure they understand their condition before I show them the cross of Jesus Christ, show them the love and mercy. You don't start with the love and mercy, man. You better make sure these people understand that they're deserving of hell, and they will split it wide open without the shed blood of Christ applied to their account. But John got saved. Now they're both bouncing around like a couple of little stinking puppy dogs, and they both have five or six teeth missing here, and they're smiling, and they're having a good old time. And I gave them each a uh, uh, paperback, uh, Sowers of Seed Bible. It's King James. And, uh, oh, they just couldn't believe I gave, gave them a Bible. I mean, they were just so thrilled. And before they left the booth, Robbie says to me, he was a guy who got saved earlier, right, the, the day before. He says, hey, would you pray for our mom, Darla? She's got a lot of physical problems. I said, well, sure, I'll do that. Okay, well, they left just having a great old time. About an hour or two later, I'm standing out near the front of the booth, and I'm talking to somebody. It was a Christian who was just, you know, I guess grateful that we were there. I don't remember the exact conversation, but, you know, hey, praise the Lord you're here. We'll be praying that for, for lost souls to be saved. And uh, out of the corner of my eye, as I'm talking to this guy, I see two guys and a woman standing next to them. <laughs> They're all standing and there smiling. And all three, including the lady, are missing five or six teeth across the top of their mouth. <laughs> and I'm thinking, great googly moogly. It's Darla. 
Well, I wrapped up this conversation here. I said, hey, I've got to get over here. And I went over there. I said, you must be Darla, without thinking about it, because I, you know, she looked at me like I was, you know, practicing witchcraft. Like, how could I possibly know she was Darla? Well, I couldn't tell her. There seems to be a family resemblance. Um, but, but Robbie says, he says, Brother Randy, will you, tell, will you tell our mom how she could trust Christ as her Savior? I said, yeah. I sat down. By the way, her boyfriend, who was saved, I don't know what he was doing unequally yoked with Darla walking around the fair, and uh, he had a nice set of dentures. Big old, looked like chiclets. I mean, really, you could, they were big, too, man. You could show a movie on any one of those things, man. They were huge. Big old white screen. And uh, he sat down with Darla, and he just kept going, hey. He goes, well, he's telling you he was right. You're a sinner, and you know what? Yeah, you're going to hell. I mean, he's like, he's just reiterating everything I'm telling her. Darla gets saved. And I stand there. Lord, unless Christians start going out, they're not going to see this kind of thing happen. And you're just going to be the God of the Bible to them, but you're going to be confined to that Bible. And they're not going to see you truly doing wonderful things like this, things that just defy explanation. Well, all three of them left with Darla's boyfriend. Happy as a lark. Two days later, I'm in the booth. Robbie Burns comes by. He goes, Brother Randy, he said, you'd be so proud of me. He said, remember that Bible you gave me? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm halfway through the book of Revolution. <laughs> and I said, you go, brother. The other one I wanted to tell you about, this is before I was even with Amazing Grace. I was in uh, Matawan, Michigan, near Kalamazoo. I just moved there, just started going to this new church, and Hurricane Katrina had just occurred. Blew all those people's homes, man, just shattered dreams, just totally blew apart that whole coast of ours, right? And uh, our church was going to Biloxi, Mississippi. I said, oh Lord, I'm just starting a new job. This would be an awesome time to go down there. These people are going to see the frailty of life, and they're going to see that things are so t temporary here on this earth, and they're going to see their need for Jesus Christ. I said, I need to go. And he said, no. I had a job to do. The church went. And man, I fussed about it for a couple of days. They were down in Biloxi, Mississippi, and I was just so upset that I couldn't go. But one day, two days after the whole church had gone, most of our church actually went. I happened to drop a piece of mail into a post office box in front of a Rite Aid drugstore. And there was a guy comes by on a bicycle, and he goes, hey, do you know any good restaurants around here? And I go, well, I just moved here myself. I said, uh, there's some up that way. I said, but let me ask you this. This guy had to be 10 years older than me, you know. I said, what are you doing on a bike? He says, oh, man. He said, I'm here uh, staying at my daughter's house because he said, my house just blew away in Hurricane Katrina. I said, Really? I said, let me ask you this. Where are you from? Biloxi, Mississippi. Can you imagine the chill that went up my spine? I couldn't go to Biloxi, Mississippi. So my Heavenly Father brought Biloxi, Mississippi to me. You ain't going to see stuff like that happen. If you don't tell God, look, in all of my unworthiness, and sometimes stupidity, and I'm not saying that about you, I'm saying it about me, I want to do my best to tell people about Jesus. You know, when I was a kid, I hated math. Story problems. Ugh, they were the worst. If Billy has three apples and gives one to Judy... How far will the train travel? <laughs> what? I'm going to lay down on the rug. My head hurts. But I will say this. In first grade, I didn't even have to be good at math in first grade because I sat behind Craig Simon. Craig Simon was our class's class genius. This guy never got any wrong in any math test he ever took. So, and I... 
feel bad about this. Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> I spent all of first grade, whenever we took a math test, looking over Craig Simon's shoulder, cheating. I never got any wrong on a math test in first grade. Learned nothing about math that year. I never got any wrong. Except one time Mrs. Conkle, my first grade teacher, pulled a real slick one. She gave us a math test on a Thursday. We got done. We handed it back in. On Friday, she handed the test back out to us. I had them all right. A hundred. So did Craig Simon. Pretty much how the system works, right? Only on this day, Mrs. Conkle did something differently. She made each of the kids go up to the blackboard one by one to work one of the problems out. <laughs> Folks, I've got all the answers on my paper, but I don't know how to work any of them out. Mr. O'Brien, you can go up and do number one for us. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you, all the way to the board, I'm doing number one, right? And I'm just kind of biding time, just kind of stretching it out, hoping something miraculous is going to happen. And she says, hey, Mr. O'Brien, yeah, show us all your work. <laughs> well, we seem to have hit a bit of a snag here then, Conkle. Yeah, because this particular answer came to me in a vision. And in visions, they don't give you the work. They just give you the answer. I mean it, young man. Show the class how you got your answer. So I drew a picture of me looking over Craig Simon's shoulder. <laughs> I say all that to say this. If I live my Christian life looking over the shoulders of my brothers and sisters in Christ to see what they're doing, I'd never obey God in soul winning. Because when I looked over those shoulders, I would almost never see them sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Surveys show that only three, listen to this, three or four percent of professing Christians ever share their faith in Christ even one time in their life. And three to four percent is probably a high number because you know some of them are lying. Surveys show that. Three to four percent of professing Christians ever share their faith in Christ even one time. I'm not talking about regular soul winners. One time. God says go, we say no. We may not say it that way, but that's in effect what we are doing. Answer this question. What is a New Testament church? A New Testament church is an organized assembly of baptized believers who band together for the purpose of what? Fulfilling the Great Commission. You should invite your friends out here and anybody you meet to hear your pastor preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But understand this, the church really and truly was intended by God to re-energize those of us who were already saved so that we would go out and tell people about Jesus. Listen closely to this. You may not believe it, or you may not understand it, but never was a more true statement made than this. Soul winning is the practical application of everything we do as Christians. When we read our Bibles every day, when we pray every day, ask God to fulfill our needs and our wants. When we come to church and hear God's word preached every time the doors are open, when we tithe, when we take part in a local church ministry, all those things are being used by God to refine you to be a better soul winner. It's almost like a barbell with all the weight on one side. Bible reading, prayer, tithing, church attendance, local church ministry, so that you can go soul winning, but over here, there's no soul winning. But when you set your mind to soul winning, all these things that God's using to refine you are going to make you a better soul winner. And by the way, when you go soul winning, you're going to find out those other things are going to be enhanced in your Christian life. They really are. 
Regarding soul winning, I would say this about the average Christian. This may be you. You don't go. Mark 16, 15. Jesus had this to say. These are his words. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But then sadly, there's also Luke 6, 46, which says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? This is kind of convicting to me, because sometimes I get on Facebook. Not as often as, as once upon a time I did. But people used to bug me about that, and they go, you're not on Facebook? Well, anybody who's anybody is on Facebook. You really, you have no idea what you're missing. You've got to be on Facebook. You really have to. I mean, all these friends of mine are just telling me, oh, you're missing everything. I get on Facebook. You know what the first entry was that I read on Facebook? Just woke up, and I'm going shopping. And I scroll down thinking, well, surely there's more. No. Nope. Just woke up and I'm going shopping. And just when it couldn't get dumber, somebody responded to it. You go, girl. <laughs> I'm not saying you shouldn't go on Facebook. I'm saying, please, if you have time for that nonsense, you certainly have time for something earth-shatteringly important, Amen. like getting the gospel out. If God gave the average Christian $1,000 for every person they won to Jesus Christ, I guarantee you they'd be soul-winning machines by the time the sun went down that day. But sadly enough, I hate to say it, Christians love money more than they do Jesus Christ most of the time. If somebody rolled up to your house and gave you a free Lamborghini, think about that. If I came up to you, Eli, well, say I didn't even know your name. I just go, hey, young man, you see that Lamborghini out there? You know what a Lamborghini is? Yeah. Okay, it's not a kind of spaghetti. <laughs> what is it? It's a car. It's a real fancy car. One of the most fancy cars there is, man. It's expensive. If I came up and I gave you the keys, I said, hey, that Lamborghini out there, that's yours. That's free. All right, here's a gas card. You never had to buy gas for it. Here's a card to take care of any repairs because you look so short you can't reach the gas pedal and the brake and you're probably going to get in some accidents here and you're going to need it to get fixed. But anyway, here's the insurance card, everything. You can have that car for the entire lifetime of that car and you will never have to pay one penny. Would that be exciting? Yeah. Dude, do you think you'd tell somebody that that had happened to you? You would be telling everybody that story every two minutes of your life. You would be pulling up to stoplights, and as if people didn't hate you enough already because you're driving a Lamborghini, you'd look over and with your great poupon on your crackers and stuff and say, some guy just gave it to me. <laughs> great, huh? And then you'd peel out, even choking in your exhaust. And you know what? after that Lamborghini had rusted and disintegrated, you'd still be telling everybody that stinking story. Until your dying breath, you'd be telling people that, Eli. Yet we as Christians profess that we know we're going to be in heaven with incorruptible bodies, totally immortal and we'll see Jesus Christ face to face for all eternity and only three to four percent of Christians ever tell that to even one person Ooh. soul winning is the practical application of everything we do as Christians regarding soul winning I would also say this to the average Christian you should go it's written on, Pastor uh, must have printed that out, it's written on your schedule right there, those of you who have signed up. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Listen to it again, Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. In other words, the fruit of a Christian is other Christians. The four main reasons why I personally go soul winning, God clearly commands me to, that should be enough right there. But I also love Jesus Christ. All around me, lost sinners are going to hell. And number four, I'd be selfish since I know how to go to heaven. And I kept that to myself. 
a couple months ago down at Calvary Road Baptist, excuse me, in my home church down in New Albany. The Lord allowed us to lead 31-year-old Brandon to Jesus Christ. Brandon was out soul winning the following Saturday with me. And he was baptized the day after that. Now, he's having a hard time in his Christian walk right now, and I'm doing everything I can to be a good Christian brother and help him out. But you know what? He's saved. He's baptized. He was going to the discipleship program. But you know what? There's some stuff creeping in there, and I'm, you know, praying for him. But you know what? God's the one who's got to deal with him, and I'm going to be there to help him. Recently, so here's a guy who got saved, and he was, ba he was out soul winning the week after. Check this out. In reverse, an 11-year-old kid named... Uh, uh, Nicholas, his mother goes to our church, brings her five kids there, right? He wasn't even saved. His mother is saved. She recently walked down the aisle and trusted Christ as her Savior, got baptized at Calvary Road Baptist. 11-year-old Nicholas asked if I would take him out soul winning. So he got to hear the gospel shared a number of times. A week after that, he walked down the aisle and trusted Christ as his Savior. Isn't that weird? Isn't that great? A few weeks ago, the Lord allowed us to lead 41-year-old Jerry to Christ. Jerry is now being discipled. I had the pleasure of going over to his house twice a week. I mean, I mean once a week, rather. And he got baptized two weeks ago, and his wife and him just joined the church. A Louisville businessman named Dean came across our church website recently. He's been saved since 1993. That's 22 years. He recently came under the conviction that he's never led anyone to Christ. And he found out that we could teach him how. In fact, he said he had, nowhere, he had no idea where to even start sharing the gospel. And the kicker, Dean and his wife go to a Catholic church. I grew up in a Catholic church. Trust me, they're not preaching the gospel. Dean comes over once a week. I'm teaching him as we go out soul winning. In the last few weeks, the Lord has allowed me and Dean to lead three people to Christ, and we've planted dozens and dozens of seeds. The Lord has truly transformed Dean's Christian walk through soul winning. He even just got a subscription to the Sword of the Lord because he found out I went to their conference down in North Carolina, and I'm, I'm telling my pastor, Pastor Mike, has he talked to you about this, Pastor Larry? It's just such an odd story. I said, there's no way with the soul winning and the Sword of the Lord that he's ever going to be able to stay in that Catholic church. It's unreal. Other men and women from our church are seeing great blessings as they become more diligent in soul winning. And over the three years we were with Amazing Grace, we got to train a lot of people, a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ and how to share their faith in Christ. We keep in touch with a lot of them on the phone now. Soul winning is the practical application of everything we do as Christians. This is an aside. Remember when you, got your, when you took your driver's training? Did it ever dawn on you? The day that you had to show up at the, whatever you call it here, what do we, Department of Motor, up in Michigan it's the Secretary of State, but you don't call it that, Department of Motor Vehicles, I guess. Would it be weird to go through the whole thing, the driver's training, take the road test and everything and the written test, all that stuff, and then not even bother to get the driver's license? That's about the closest I can come. As a, for an analogy, is how a Christian can walk their Christian walk and never share their faith in Christ. It'd be like going through high school, uh, you know, K through 12, and then just going, ah, I don't want the diploma. What are you, kidding? Soul winning is a practical application of everything we do as Christians. And finally, regarding soul winning, I would say this to the average Christian. You can go. You're too shy? My friend John Jackson in Asheville, North Carolina, one of the shyest people I know, I said, John, you really get out of your comfort zone. I said, truly, you are going to see great blessings in heaven because you open your mouth even though you look terrified, dude. I said, why do you go? He said, well, Randy, God told me to. Good for you. You say you're too scared? A couple years ago, down in, in, uh, in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, I was at Emmanuel Baptist Church. A lady comes up after. She says, Brother O'Brien, this is my friend Tristan. He's 11 years old. Tristan has been beaten up several times. And the last time, as he was trying to share his faith in Christ, by the way, the last time he had his Bible urinated on. 
And, you know, I could feel my eyes kind of stinging because I was trying to hold back, you know, a little moisture. I said, well, how'd that make you feel, Tristan? I was 11 years old. He looked at me, he goes, Jesus died for me. Yeah. Too shy, too scared. Mm. Maybe you're thinking, I'm not smart enough. Kevin Kirkland, a friend of mine from down by Tampa, he goes soul winning. He's mentally challenged. He led his stepmother to Christ and called me to double check to make sure he did everything right. Took me down to Romans Road on the phone. I said, hey, praise the Lord, brother. Now, he's not extremely mentally challenged, but he's mentally challenged. And then on January 1 of this year, while my wife and I were at Dillard's, what is it with you ladies in Dillard's? Do you know the store I'm talking about? My wife likes it. I don't know. Maybe she's different. I don't know. He calls me and says, Brother Randy, my, 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 my stepmother is getting baptized this week. God will use you just the way you are. Sharing the gospel of Christ is not rocket science. Think about it. If it were rocket science, only rocket scientists could be saved. Are you a rocket scientist? Me neither. You need proof? When I was a little kid, I came home from school one day and I asked my dad if grape seeds make you constipated. Someone at school had told me that grape seeds make you constipated. I thought, well, that's an odd thing, but my dad would know. He knows everything. I said, Dad, do grape seeds make you constipated? And without smiling or anything, my dad just looked at me and said, only if they get caught in there sideways. <laughs> and I filed this away in my little, like, eight or nine-year-old brain as a fact. My junior year of high school, I'm in a biology class, which included a lot of seniors, too, by the way. And, you know, when you're in 11th grade, seniors, man, they might as well be 10 years older than you, right? They're like, ooh, they're cool, and they're older, and ooh, you know, they're so worldly. They're going over the basic food groups. They get to the fruit, and Mr. King says, well, okay, let's move on. I'll go, wait a minute, and I raise my hand. Here's something interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was hyperventilating, man. I grew up very shy. I know that's another thing. God will use you the way you are. I grew up very shy. Had asthma, bad skin, bad skin. Uh, anyway, he says, Mr. O'Brien? I said, you know, it's interesting. I said, grape seeds can make you constipated. <laughs> he says, what? Yeah, that's right. They can make you constipated. He said, really? Well, only if they get stuck in there sideways. <laughs> the crowd fell on the floor laughing. And fortunately for me, they actually thought I was a comic genius. They didn't think I was just an idiot. Because I thought what I was telling them was true. Stuck in there sideways. A few very basic things regarding soul winning that you may or may not know, and then we will close. The most important ingredient in soul winning, does anybody know what it is? I always find this interesting. People get all worked up about this. And by the way, you have every right to be afraid, to a degree, of the fact that you are facing one of Satan's children. But by the way, you were once one of Satan's children too. Okay? I told my pastor, I said, one of my worst fears is going to someone's door knocking. By the way, we don't just go door knocking. You just walk up to people. You'll see. You'll see when we go. And, you know, we might get shot down by everybody, but you will see. God is the one who says, just go. I'm not, I'm not the Savior. I'm the messenger. If God wants to put me out there, hey, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what command do unto me. <laughs> but when we're out there, People get all worked up. You know what the number one ingredient of soul winning is? Prayer. Prayer. Prayer is the battleground. The soul winning is really just the mopping up operation. Truly it is. You'll find that out as you start going and making it part of your life. 
Mark 11, 24 says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. This is actually on one of your sheets right here. Two things. Oh, as you pray, by the way, just very simple things to pray for. Ask the Lord to empower you with His Holy Spirit, to clear away any obstacles that might distract from the hearing of His Word. Prepare the hearts of the lost people you're going to meet and give clarity to your thoughts and words. And to also call to mind appropriate verses. By the way, you get some verses in your head, it'll increase your confidence. You'll learn that as you go too. Number two, two important things every good soul owner should possess, a teachable spirit and a desire to proclaim His name. Truly, God's going to teach you more than I'm ever going to teach you. But I'm going to get you off to a good start if you go. Three things every gospel presentation should be. It should be clear, scriptural, and thorough. Clear, scriptural, and thorough. Number four, four things every gospel presentation must include. And be thinking about this every time you approach somebody. You're a sinner. Your sin is going to be paid for in hell. Jesus Christ, as your substitute, paid for it on your behalf. You receive that. Salvation is a gift. You're a sinner. Your sin will be paid for in hell. Jesus Christ is your substitute, paid it for you. You receive it as a gift. People go, it's that simple? God didn't make it rocket science. Amen. Now, while you can learn some things here in a classroom setting, the most effective learning is going to take place out there. For those of you who signed up, truly, I'm not joking when I say I will not make you embarrassed. I will not put you in a, in a, in a, you know, a situation where you feel silly. Nothing like that. I will do all the talking, and if you at any point want to, want, to, want to speak, that's fine. That's fine. But I guarantee you're going to learn something. Soul winning is a practical application of everything we do. A soul winning church is a vibrant church. Daniel 12, 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I would ask you this question. Are you ready to shine for the one who died for you. Let's stand with our eyes closed, if you would, and I have Pastor Larry come up. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful, again, for your son, Jesus Christ, more than anything. I'm so thankful for opportunity to be here on this earth still so that I might be used in whatever way you see fit. But, Lord, I especially am grateful that you get us out there so winning. And I pray that you just work on the hearts of maybe some people here who are signed up, Maybe a little apprehensive right now, but that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. We get apprehensive going to whitewater rafting too, but we still go. Oh Lord, help them understand that this is truly, truly a most precious thing in your sight, that people go out and, and herald the, the cause of Christ. And Lord, for those of those here tonight that haven't signed up and maybe they're kind of on the fence, Lord, I pray they would understand that... Uh, you're on our side, and you want them in heaven more than we do, and you'll go with us. And, Lord, it'll be your power, and we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.